Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up... Airgun World Editor Terry Doe is giving us the expert's guide on how to be safe and keep within the law with your air rifle. In the news, we expose the incredible technology that can spot a mouse at almost half a mile. And Roy Lupton is blowing, sucking and squeaking for Britain. First, Taylor's travels. David Taylor is in Scotland watching the red deer rut and talking about the politics of stalking. This week in Taylor's Travels, we're in the Monolia Hills of Inverness. I'm here with stalker Jimmy Irvin, and I'm keeping a low profile because we're just witnessing one of the greatest events in nature. The red deer rut started early this year in these parts on the 1st of October. It is now the end of October, and the rut is coming to a close. Even though the minds of these animals are on other things, we have to stalk in carefully. We reach a spying point 200 yards from the group. We pause for Jimmy to explain the biology of the beasts. The rat starts with the big, the big stags. They'll, they'll uh, take over the hinds. They'll come out to the hinds, yeah. and they take over the hinds, and they'll hold that hinds as long as they can, until, you know, either another big stag comes in and chases him out, or yet, uh, he, he loses his weight, and more or less that's him finished. He will sort of make his way home then, like. Then the middle class take over. And the same thing happens again. Then the young ones, the smaller stags take over. So these are the young ones we're seeing here? There is some big ones just in there, mm -hmm. sort of the middle class ones. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the right big boys are home. Mm -hmm. they're, they're more or less home now, like. They've had know? their time. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it just, you know, it's like a, it's a bit like a ball, it's revolving, you know, and it, mm -hmm. it's just amazing how nature works with them, like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. And then once the rut's over, what does the make up of the herd? Well, then? once the rut's over, all the stags, most of the stags, the big lads, will go back to wherever the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hoping most of our big lads come home. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy takes his deer extremely seriously. Back at the yard, he shows us a selection of heads. So, so tell me about this deer. Uh, well, the reason why we shot this lad is because he's uh, beginning to go back uh, on his uh, big points here. Mm -hmm. You know, if he had his points out, just out level with this, then we, we would have left him, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the only reason why we take him out was because he was uh, just going back. And the teeth uh, for aging, um, I'll just leave him there, is uh, just here. This stag is not, you know, he's he's about roughly about seven, eight year old, and uh, it's just the way the closer to the jaw, the older he is. Those are just the heads from the deer shot this year. In a shed, Jimmy has some extraordinary trophies, going back decades. This here is what I call a four-cornered four -cornered stag. He's got one, two, three, four cornets. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been damaged in growth, and uh, it's more or less four cornets, four horns, growing out these. And did each of those grow each year in velvet and then... Um, it's hard to say because uh, oh, I killed them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so I didn't know the following year. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, 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 I've never ever seen it before. Mm -hmm. Never ever seen thing. it before. None of this would be possible without Jimmy's careful management techniques. And then uh, in, the, in the winter time, that's where we're hinds. We go in there for shelter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've seen the whole lot, just the old head for there when there's a storm coming. Uh, there'd be, now there'd be around about 350, uh, roughly about that, hinds going in there when the, you know, when, the, when there's a fight out, like, you know, because this just goes, this just goes totally white and there's no, no grazing up on there, so they've got to come down, so they do scraping in the woods or on some of the knolls, like, you know, mm -hmm. but then when you've got the deer doing that, the scraping, you've got the grouse comes in behind the deer and they get the pickings. You know, when the deer open it up, it's the same as the, if there's hares, you know, they're there and getting the scrapings too, and it, they all work for one another mm. just to survive, like. 
you know? keep the balance themselves. Oh, I yes. Jimmy is not just about deer, deer and more deer. He takes an holistic approach to wildlife in the estate. He has strong views about the politics of deer. You know, estates up in, up in the highlands, you know, that's what it all started off with, sort of, you know, sporting estates being deer, grouse and salmon fishing. Mm -hmm. Not white other species out to achieve something else like, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, uh, it's just, it's all wrong. So, so I definitely think, just say, for instance, if there was a place buying an estate, an owner, a wealthy owner, they should put into it a uh, sort of rule or whatever into it, saying, right, whatever's on that ground, you must look after. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm meaning? So you can conserve what's on the ground? Yes, mm -hmm. not, not wipe them out just to achieve one. You know, say if a man came up here and bought this estate and he wanted grouse, if it was written down in it that you, you have to have all, everything that's here, then that's it, he can't change that, and that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're wanting a grouse moor, go down into Yorkshire and buy one. If, you know, that's where there is grouse moors down there. Mm -hmm. But don't don't buy an estate and then just uh, wipe everything out just to achieve a uh, uh, sort of one thing. Like mm -hmm. that's my view on it. Like, but probably a lot of people will disagree with that. Like, my colleagues at Countryside Line Scotland are working to change political opinion in Scotland about deer. If you'd like to go stalking with Jimmy. Contact sporting agent Lackey Smith on email ls at highlandsporting.com. Jimmy starred in a series of DVDs about Highland gamekeepers. For a copy of Life of a Highland Keeper, visit www.countryside-video.co.uk. For more about the work of the Countryside Alliance, go to www.countryside-alliance.org.uk. Now from Deer to Deer David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. The RSPB is reporting that birds of prey poisonings is down by 18% and the number of raptors are reaching record highs. However, the organisation is still trying to use its figures to whip up hatred against gamekeepers. Along with other shooting organisations, the National Gamekeepers Organisation condemns all wildlife crime. It says the tolerance shown by the vast majority of gamekeepers is commendable. An angler is said to be more gutted than the fish he caught. Kurt Price, a 25-year-old angler from Monmouthshire, cooked and ate this monster sea bass before realising it's probably a rod caught record, says The Sun. The British record sea bass is 19 pounds and 11 ounces. This one, caught off Tenby in South Wales, is easily £20 plus. But Kurt has nothing more than scales to tip the scales. The writers of the BBC's flagship rural soap opera The Archers are in a bit of a lather this week after they depicted a character borrowing a shotgun to go on a shoot, even though he'd just come out of jail. It provoked outrage amongst the shooting organisations. A Countryside Alliance spokesman says the BBC should be more careful about playing fast and loose with the strict laws which govern the possession of guns in this country. This is another example of the BBC failing to understand that we take the distinction between law breakers and the law abiding very seriously in the shooting community. And finally, here's a sad tale about a mouse. Optics company Zeiss has a new thermal imaging system designed to provide an early warning for bird strikes at airports. It was testing the system at Copenhagen Airport when it spotted this pair of foxes at 500 metres away. Then it even picks out a mouse. Unfortunately, the rodent was not around for long. It dodges one jet, then a second runs it over. You're now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Now follows a film with Air Gun World editor Terry Doe with some helpful hints on how to enjoy your air rifle within the law, whatever your age or experience. Hello, my name's Terry Doe and I'm here at Bisley, surrounded by thousands of people enjoying their shooting legally and safely. And that's my message for you today. It's no less fun, in fact it's much more fun, if you're safe 
and your legal when you're shooting your air gun. These things these days are so much more sophisticated. They're so much better value for money. They do more in terms of shooter pleasure or performance or when it comes to taking vermin. They can do pretty much anything you want them to do. All you have to do is use them safely and legally. And that really is a simple thing to do. Mainly, you do not allow any one of your shots to travel beyond the boundaries where you've got permission to shoot. You do not ever engage a target through the scope, through the open sights, or even pointing down the barrel that isn't a legitimate target. And if you never point one of these things at anything that isn't a legal and safe thing to shoot at, then 95% of the problems we see would never exist. We're going to cover the golden rules of safe air gun use. But before we do that, I'd like to give you my piece of best advice. Join an air gun club. You'll learn more, you'll see more, you'll have more to shoot at, you'll be surrounded by people who think and do what you do, and you'll have the best time of your life, I promise you. My joining a club led to me pursuing a, a wonderful sport for over 10 years. I even ended up in the business because of that, but it all started when I joined a club. I can't emphasize it strongly enough. Find out where your nearest club is, get yourself along, and get involved. You won't regret it. This is a very simple, but entirely essential piece of safety instruction for you. It's how to cock and load a brake barrel air rifle, which is probably the most common kind used. All you have to do is start with your finger away from that trigger, get a grip around the actual rifle grip there, put it into your hip, Hold the barrel right at the end, right near the muzzle. Don't hold it down here. You won't get the leverage and it could slip. So hold it right at the end, bring it down smoothly, and above all, keep hold of the barrel. Do not let that barrel go. Take your hand off the grip. The rifle is already propped in the hip. Get yourself a pellet, put the pellet in, back to the grip, finger still away from the trigger, bring it up gently and gently close the barrel. Don't slam it, there's no need at all and now you're ready to fire. There you go, couldn't be simpler and it's totally safe. One of the greatest things about air gun shooting is that it's so easy to do and so easy to enjoy. You don't have to be a genius at it, you don't have to be a world champion at it, you just do it at your pace, you do it and get what you want to get out of it. You can go all the way or you can just play in the back garden, as long as you do so safely and legally. There's also a demand that when this gets home it's stored legally and responsibly. It's now a point of law. You have to store these responsibly or you will be liable if it's used in a crime. Now that doesn't mean you have to lock it up in a steel cabinet. It just means you have to keep it out of harm's way and take reasonable precautions. And to our way of thinking that's put it in a cupboard, a lockable one preferably, store it separately from your pellets and don't ever leave it loaded or the pellets anywhere near it. Just take sensible precautions just as you would with your gardening equipment. You wouldn't leave your mower running on the lawn when there are kids around, so don't leave these things lying around. They are perfectly safe, but it's up to you to keep them from falling into the wrong hands. And if you do that, there can never ever be a problem. Every air gunner needs to understand that shooting safely and legally isn't a restriction, it's a skill. It's also a technique that helps you enjoy your shooting even more and helps you become more successful. Down here at Bisley, safety aspects are controlled by marshals. Everything's done properly and you'll do well to learn it. But when you're in your garden, you are the marshal. You have to take care of it all and that's easy to do. Make sure you secure all exits to your range. Make sure that everything you're shooting at won't bounce pellets back at you or out of your range. Make sure there are no pets on the range and absolutely do not allow anyone near the rifles or the pistols that isn't responsible or isn't supervised. Anyone under the age of 14 must be closely supervised by someone over 21 years of age. But everybody on an air gun range is a marshal and safety is everybody's responsibility. There you go, told you there wasn't too much to it. Well, the shooting and the fun goes on here at Bisley and we're all shooting safely and legally. As I keep saying, there's no strain on us. It doesn't make a difference to our fun. In fact, it increases it. Stay safe, stay legal, stay within the very strict laws that control air gunning, and you won't go wrong. It's dead easy.
It's all common sense. Now, since we offered a few of our viewers the chance of buying the silver fox whistle from Australia a couple of weeks ago, there have been a few problems. Mainly not being able to make the thing sing. Well, help is at hand in that the creators of the Silver Fox are allowing us to supply the DVD online in the next week or so. But in the meantime, here is Roy with a few notes of his own. We've been asked by some of the viewers to um, demonstrate some of the, the calling techniques, particularly with the Silver Fox, because it, uh, it appears that uh, a few guys that have, uh, have bought the whistles are really struggling a little bit to, to get some sound out of it. So what we're going to try and do is just a little bit of a, a quick demonstration on you know, how we call and, and what we do um, and how we get the, the best success. So uh, we're going to start off just with um, one of the old type widgeon whistles. Um, and again, very good call. And, and it always pays to have lots of different calls on you because you know at certain times of the year, one call might work better than the other. Um, and in an area where that call's been heard quite a few times before, it's always good just to uh, to change about and try something new. So um, the good old faithful widgeon whistle is just a, a simple one of pop it in the mouth, hold it in between your lips and your teeth, and then suck. Mm -hmm. So I think you can make it louder or uh, softer by covering it with your mouth and you just put a little bit of um, vibrato into the call uh, as you're drawing in you just wobble your throat a little bit and uh, so you get the, the call there um, I think this one is, is called a wham um, and this is really a, a rodent squeak uh, so if you've got a fox coming in um, and it's not too far off and you just want to bring it that little bit closer then you can change over to the, the little rodent squeak whistle and because uh, as I say this is incredibly soft uh, uh, just to give you an idea if you try and get any more volume on that and really suck on it then uh, it just goes dead so hang on so that was sucking too hard there's very little that comes out so you've really got to sort of tone down how much you call then um, obviously you've got the good old mouth, uh, you can either squeak with your mouth or squeak on the back of your hand, so just wet the back of your hand. Which is a, a very good one again. So if you're, you're caught out and you haven't got any of your whistles with you, then you should always be able to do a, a mouth squeak or a, a hand squeak. Um, this has been a very successful call for me as well, this is a, a fox caller um, by name. Um, and very very simple it's, it's I suppose based on a harmonica system so you uh, you just grip it with your teeth um, and you can just squeeze down and release and that alters the pitch but again you've still got to put the life into the call yourself so you've got to give it the vibrato and it's so if it's if you have if you're not putting any any grip on it it's just a and then that goes down as you put the uh, the tension on it to And then obviously, you know, depending on how you want to call, then you can uh, you can alter that. And I always find that a lot of people don't put enough life into the call. They might sit there and just give it a <coughs> like that. But really, you've got to you've got to put the life into it. Obviously, if you've heard um, a rabbit that's uh, being attacked by a stoat or something like that, then you you really want to try and emulate that. So it's. So you really alter it and you put a lot of life into the call. Um, you know, that's obviously the best way. Now, by far the hardest one to call, um, or by far the hardest one to use, um, that I've used so far is the Silver Fox. But once you do get it, it really is a good call. But it took me probably half a day of perseverance and, and working with it to get it working, um, or even to get a note out of it before I sort of perfected it. And with this one, what we're going to do is just have a, a quick run through with the guys out there that have bought one. Um, just to try and give you a little bit of instruction, a little bit of help on uh, on how to get it working. And what I do is I start off by putting my tongue onto the back of the call. So it's not the tip of my tongue I use, I use sort of halfway along my tongue. About there, sorry about the uh, looking into my mouth there. But you put it on the back of your tongue and then insert, your, uh, insert the call into your mouth. You want it about halfway, about there. And depending on how far in the call is will depend on what pitch you get. So the further you go in, the deeper the call, the further out, uh, the harsh or the, 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 uh, the higher pitch the call. So just to show you how that works, it's... <laughs> <laughs> 
put it in your mouth, and then. So as you saw, as it went in, and the, the, the call got deeper, the tone got deeper. As I came out, it got slightly, slightly lighter. When the call is on your, the halfway on your tongue, I tip my tongue downwards, touching the back of my teeth. So when I'm blowing it, the air is coming in from the top of the call, and you're blanking out any air from the bottom of your mouth. So it's in onto the tongue, and then the tip of my tongue is down onto the bottom of my teeth. And you can either get the vibrato into the call by wobbling your throat, or you can do it by putting it into your mouth, holding the call in between your thumb and your forefinger into the mouth, and so you can see you get that the movement of the, or so you get the uh, the different or differential in the sound by wobbling the call back and forth. If you can't do it with your with your throat. Um, and, and it really is as simple as that. I mean, it really is frustrating when you're starting out, but with a little bit of perseverance and a bit of work, it, uh, it really does come good. But uh, yeah, I know, I know a few guys have been talking about uh, weighing it in for the, uh, the scrap metal value, but uh, it is worth having a go and uh, you'll see the results for yourself. If all else fails and uh, you've run out of puff, then we can always go back to the old polystyrene. So uh, again, just wet it. Um, works really well on the, uh, the windscreen of your car or uh, any other available glass. Uh, let's just wet it down like that and and there we have it so uh, you know again I mean good it's good old polystyrene a very cheap call but uh, over the years um, I know a lot of people that have bought many a fox to bag with that so uh, they all work but you just need to to practice them um, and make sure that you're confident with it when you go out there and start calling. So uh, that's it. Many, many hours sitting in and uh, playing with your toys. Well, we're back next week. And if you're watching this on YouTube, as usual, click to subscribe to us, which is somewhere on the outside of the screen there. Or go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can scroll down to the bottom. There's a constant contact box there. You can put your email address in there. You can click to like us on Facebook in the same place or follow us on Twitter. And we'll send you details of our programme, which is out every Wednesday from 7 o'clock. From the lowliest worm fisher to the mightiest big game hunter, this is... Field Sports Britain. <laughs>